А сейчас я хочу предоставить нашему дорогому гостю из Германии, вот все-таки из Германии или США, Джонатану, Джонатану Тененбауму. Прошу. Есть, есть вот. а наушники все взяли? Да, прошу прощения, если я стараюсь, я буду э, изложить свои соображения на английском языке. Это быстрее и это легче для меня. Я учился русскому языку очень много лет. Это. Um, I spend about half of my time on music as a pianist. Не, 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 не. Does everybody understand me in English? Yes? Okay. Okay. I spend one half of my time on classical music as a pianist and the other half on fundamental science, mainly physics. And the relationship between fundamental science and economics and society. In science, the universe we live in or the universe is infinite, like the human mind. The more you look, the more you see, the more you find. Somebody will tell you, oh, we know about the, how the universe was started, the Big Bang, and we know all, the, we know all the, uh, the particles, and we have all the laws of physics. Nonsense. If you study fundamental science in its development, you see that we are always at the beginning of knowledge. We are never at the end. We always are at the beginning. Why is this important? Well, because changes in discoveries in science and big changes in science are connected with the creative capabilities of the human mind. And, with, and if you look at the different modes of economic development and social development, you can see two different types. I would call one linear, the other nonlinear. Already this has been uh, discussed. And connected with that, what I would call extensive development and intensive development. Not linearity ba in economic terms means you basically take the technology and the ways that you have of doing things and just expand. The automobile society uh, or the society, um, in, in a certain sense, this is happening with information technology. Maybe some people won't agree with me, but we're getting more and more information, but the meaning of the information is reduced. Most of the information, most of the data is really useless. This is my polemic. So we have a situation every year, 500 billion plastic bottles are produced. About for each of us, about 100 tons of material are consumed and moved in the world economy per capita. Uh, it's obvious that this cannot be extended linearly. Uh, so, I don't believe that we are destroying the world, the, the earth. I think that's nonsense, but there are problems. So uh, therefore we need a, a, a transformation to an intensive form of development. That means we do more with less. Actually, we don't really have less, but we get to higher qualities. So what does that mean? So, I believe that the, 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 the goal of all of this is not economic growth, it's human happiness. I think we should look at humanism, put the human being in the center. And that's the, the measuring rod. So, and human beings, I believe, are, uh, are human beings when they develop, development, pragideas, you could say. That's a characteristic of evolution. Vernadsky, who was mentioned, had this idea that the biosphere is developing into a, uh, uh, a new stage of the noosphere. 
that means also using human reason to direct economic activity. So, extensive and intensive. Well, what is intensive examples of intensive development? Well, I'll look at just the technological aspect. If we take a laser and we focus the, the energy on a small spot, we have increased the intensity of energy use. So in physical economy, we see that to get a larger effect, a qualitatively larger effect, we concentrate energy. More energy, more power per unit uh, area. That's how man started with tools. If you use a hammer, you're concentrating energy in space, in time, and with other tools in space. We see, for example, the development of, en of engines, the transformation from a steam engine to an internal combustion en engine is a increase of orders of magnitude in the energy density. Why am I saying this? Because we have a world economy that's based on burning fossil fuels, basically. And fossil fuels are very extensive. So where do we go? I'll say, mention in a minute. Another example, but I'll get back to that. Another example of increase in intensity is urbanization, if it's done in the right way. We concentrate population into a smaller area where the infrastructure becomes more efficient or can, if you make good cities, um, and where the productivity can increase. Um, I have to shorten greatly. <laughs> I should mention that a lot of people think the future of energy is going to be in wind and solar energy. I think this is nonsense. Why? Um, solar wind uses, and solar energy and wind uses, uses a huge area. It's extremely intensive. It uses about 50% more material than an ordinary power plant or a nuclear power plant. So you, it may be useful, but we cannot uh, 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 spread over the entire Earth's surface solar uh, panels and wind en energy. That's not the direction, in fact, that's a step backwards in energy intensity. So we need a more intense form of energy. Well, we have nuclear. Nuclear reactions release between a thousand and a million times more energy than chemical reactions. So nuclear fuel per kilogram produces about a million times as much energy in the right technology as a chemical fuel. We see the terrible demonstration of this in the hydrogen bomb and atomic bomb. Oh. Well, we have now first generation of utilizing that and we must do it much better because we're not doing it very well. Nuclear energy is in the stone age. It works pretty well if you do it right, but we can do much better. I can't go into details, but Technology exists today to actually make nuclear fission uh, safe and small in size and to actually use nuclear reactors to burn the waste, to eliminate the, the radioactive waste. Then there's fusion. the uh, And there's a form of fusion which is very interesting and today, there is an enormous development of fusion. A lot of private investment into this area, a lot of new ideas. And there's a form of fusion called boron hydrogen fusion. It's a, a different form and it has a very good advantage. It produces no radioactivity and it produce, releases its energy in the form of charged particles, which means you can get the energy directly as electricity. And then there's something, and very small, very small reactors uh, that could even fly in airplanes. In fact, the first nuclear react reactors in the 50s in the Soviet Union and the United States uh, were planned in, uh, actually to put them in bombers. But that was the, that time. So, uh, and there's a relationship between fusion 
and the development of technologies with very high um, power density. We have now femtosecond lasers. Lasers that produce energy for a time of a femtosecond. That means 10 to the minus 15 seconds. Now, this is stipendia minus 15 seconds. A small amount of energy, but put into that small period of time can trigger nuclear reactions. So we have another area called uh, low energy nuclear reactions. This was uh, very famous. Uh, the first uh, experiments was called cold fusion. It probably is not fusion, but it is real. There are real situation, real experiments where nuclear reactions are produced with almost no energy and with no radioactivity. This, and the reason is, nuclear physics is, a lot of nuclear physics is based on uh, making collisions between individual um, um, nuclei, individual particles. What was left out is that if you put the particles in a crystal, in a very high density medium, they behave in a different way. Uh, and so we find you have a new nuclear physics called the nuclear physics in condensed matter. Why do I say that? We are coming to a point where, if science continues, we will be able to control nuclear processes uh, instead of uh, um, and be able to do, deal with a lot of the problems. Another point, computers. I just take a couple of examples. The human, the human mind is not digital. There are no two things more different than a logical switch, a transistor in a digital computer, and the neurons in the human mind, which are living organisms. The human mind has nothing to do with the digital computer. That's why present day artificial intelligence is stupid. It's useful, but it is stupid in a very profound way. I've written a whole series of articles about that. Where, we, where can we go? Well, if we want to make better, uh, let's say, types of computers, we can make analog computers. I believe the future is in analog computers, uh, analog uh, computer. No? Computers that use different physical processes, not digital. And then there are quantum computers, a development which is uh, uh, coming, new materials, and so on. There is high temperature superconductors, a high temperature super, superconductor that can carry 10,000 times more electrical current per unit size than an ordinary copper cable. And that makes, allows you to make motors that are much smaller, electric motors. So, I come to the end, I can see signs that I'm coming to the end of the time. Um, space. We cannot extend the present space technology linearly. If, if human beings are going to go in large scale to other planets, then we cannot use rockets where 90% of the weight is fuel. And where a couple people are on top of this huge Thing. It was good as for a few people, but we need fundamentally different types of ways to get people and equipment into orbit and to other planets. Nuclear or fusion could be one way. Tsiolkovsky, uh, Tsiolkovsky had a fantastic idea of the space elevator, which you can find. I want to describe it now. There are lots of ideas, but this is the, this is the future. And I think the Cosmonautica is a very special area of intensive development because all the areas of science, also of culture, also of sociology come together uh, in, 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 in one area. So finally, um, there are two, I could distinguish between two fundamentally different types of thinking, perhaps, 
analogous. One I would call combinatorial. Um, you put things together. You make, logical, you make logical deductions from axioms, say, in mathematics. Uh, people today, a lot of young people are trained very well in co combinatorics. You combine things. You make computer programs. You put software together. There's another type of, of thinking which is conceptual. A concept, if it's a correct concept, is an intense way to express something very complicated, like a very good poem. A poem, if it's a very good poem that's expressing something, it expresses something in just a few words that would take many books to explain. Therefore, we want in fundamental science to make progress. We want this second type of thinking. So, um, and I can tell you that in areas such as quantum physics, because I'm involved in this, we are in a period of a renaissance. The fundamental, uh, quantum physics was the last really fundamental uh, revolution in physics. There has not been a fundamental revolution in physics since over the last 100 years, what I would call fundamental. But now we're getting there uh, in the study of the so-called subquantum level of reality. I can't go into details. Final idea. Um, I believe that in the coming period, we will get to a situation, I, I think we should, get to a situation where a, a large or significantly percentage of the population will be actively involved in scientific research. Oh. Instead of 10,000 astronomers that we have approximately worldwide, we need 50 million or 300 million astronomers. What will they do? Well, in our galaxy, we have, according to the present knowledge, about 200 billion, billion stars. Uh, according to, yes, according to uh, the so-called the Hubble telescope, the space telescope, uh, we have within the range of what we can observe with present technology, about 200 billion galaxies. So there is a lot of lot to study. There's enough work uh, for world population many times. Uh, what are people doing with their time? Watching television. Well, my previous speakers have very well presented <laughs> pedagogically this problem. I think that this is a very, very important uh, direction. In fact, there already exists something called citizen science, where already millions of people participate in the analysis of astronomical pictures, uh, microscope pictures of cells to tell whether they're ca cancerous cells and so forth. It's very popular, but at a very low, lo low level because we don't have enough scientists to even watch the pulsars in our galaxy. So millions of people are actually involved in this by just looking at pictures. So that's my uh, a dream, but I think it will happen, um, of moving to an intensive form of economic development where we don't have to destroy nature. Well, we can have most of the earth as a garden. We have wonderful cities. Uh, we have a, a urban agriculture if we want. We can produce lots of food, but what will the people do? There you get to intensive use of the human mind. I think that's the central issue, and uh, I, I'm very happy to hear that in many of the presentations here. Thank you.
при каких условиях человечество сможет, как вы говорите, преодолеть э, глобальные проблемы? Вот. Какие условия? Да. При каких условиях? При каких? Я думаю, что другие спикеры уже затронули эту проблему. I didn't go into the political aspect and the cultural, well, the cultural aspect is very important as was uh, one of the speakers emphasized um, because a change in the quality of thinking may begin to occur before it is expressed politically. Oh. Um, so I, I, I would like to have a world revolution that would be wonderful and all these ideas would be realized. Uh, I can't rule that out, but I think probably it will be a complicated struggle. Oh. In other words, we cannot wait until certain conditions exist in order to move in these directions. I don't know if I'm answering your question. Very hard to answer it, yeah. Uh, I think it's a kind of a personal question, actually. Yes, I would take it as a personal question not expect that good conditions will be created for you, but decide how, what you want to do in the conditions which exist. Это ответ полезный. Следующий вопрос. Представляйтесь, пожалуйста. Да, здравствуйте, меня зовут Артем Ротковский. Вы упомянули о количестве необходимых астрономов для изучения звездного неба. Скажите, а вы можете приблизительно сказать, сколько нам физиков потребуется? Вот вы считаете, что сейчас глобально физиков достаточно для... или нам нужно больше, меньше? Спасибо. Достаточно. I believe that, that human knowledge is something that's, that's, that's valuable by itself. In other words, It's all, if you say достаточно, нет того. I think we need more thinking because thinking is something positive. Creative thinking is more positive, is something positive. There are enough problems in physics, especially on the experimental side, the phenomenological side, to, for a billion people to be working on physics. There's enough problems. Uh, uh, And uh, of course, to do something, uh, uh, to have a real result in working on physics, you have to have a certain training. Although you can start in analyzing certain experiments, which with present technology produce a huge amount of data that the existing physicists today cannot possibly analyze. There are not enough of them. So there is a big problem though. If we are going to have 50 million physicists or 50 million people who at least spend some of their time taking part in Shasvalites of Razvite uh, Physiku, uh, if we're going to have those people, how to organize it? Uh, how to have experts that can work together with people who don't have a large training? It's a huge Uh, I'm not going to, this is for you. <laughs> this is going to be the next decades. I'm only telling you that there is a potential for a kind of transformation of society because if somebody, I just, one moment. If you remember, both in, in all countries, there is a tradition of amateur astronomy. People who have a hobby. In the United States, there's a famous one who was a truck driver. And he built the largest telescope that any amateur built. And he would drive all day, and in the night, he would come back and start to build on his telescope. This is the passion uh, uh, of, of wanting to contribute something to society. So, That, of course, science is not the only contribution you, you can make. It's only one area, but there's a potential area uh, uh, which could have a transformative effect. 
Ребята, еще вопрос. У нас такая большая география участников. Я сейчас говорю, даже вот только континент Евразия, да? Вот у нас тут и Бельгия, и Дальний Восток. У нас есть Дальний Восток. Но Дальний Восток молчит. Почему Дальний Восток не задает вопросы? У нас есть настоящие курсанты, победители конкурса «Горизонт-2100». Иван, Морской государственный университет, город Владивосток. У меня такой вопрос по поводу ядерных технологий. Вы говорили в основном только о плюсах и благоприятном развитии благодаря ядерным технологиям. А что вы можете сказать о возможности губительных последствий для экологии вследствие ошибок человека? Well, I... Uh, I said, obviously, um, every technology, and especially technologies which release a large amount of energy, can have a very bad effect on the ecology. We hear about this all, all the time. Yeah? I think it's somewhat exaggerated. I'm not a catastrophist. And I think the sense of catastrophe is being used to manipulate, manipulate us to make people scared. I think we need, we, need, we need to look at it with a cool head. Nuclear is probably, it's, I think, the least, in terms of generating a large amount of energy, the least danger to the environment. Even Chernobyl, which was a terrible accident. Even Chernobyl. If you look at the number of people who die because of air pollution or, or other reasons. So it's always a question, what do you do with it? Uh, I'm sure that the future development of nuclear energy and other areas of physics will produce the possibility of more terrible destruction. May, maybe, but man has made terrible destruction without nuclear technology. Uh, so this is, this, is, this is a challenge. But as I say, intensive development means exactly you reduce the so-called footprint. You reduce the, the amount of matter you require. You control it better. So France, for example, has 70% of its electricity from nuclear energy. There's no CO2, um, and uh, I see no reason. Uh, that was a long time ago they built these reactors. Now we can do it much better. I don't have time to give you a specific example. Thank you. Rachel, yeah? mm -hmm. uh, Rachel Lloyd from the United States. I wanted to ask if there was anything maybe besides quantum computers that would be contributing to uh, the intensity, yes, uh, that you had been speaking of, specifically within the field of quantum physics. <laughs> well, uh, I don't know exactly in what direction you're thinking. Mm -hmm. I think that artificial intelligence in application to fundamental science um, can be very useful in the analysis of data and can be a big problem if we try to use it to develop new concepts because artificial intelligence is stupid, at least in the present forms. You don't get as much, the intelligence you get out of artificial intelligence is not more than the intelligence that human beings put into it. But it's a very good way, like every tool to organized to detect patterns, to analyze data, and so on. So of course, in our daily lives, it's used a lot to recognize all these things. But for fundamental science, we don't have any better computer, and it's not a computer, <laughs> than the human mind. 
Uh, because also the human mind is able to form new conceptions and it's not a digital thing. So we, I don't think we will ever understand the, the mind. Why? Be, because you say, well, but the human brain it, uh, works according to the laws of physics. But wait a minute, do we know all the laws of physics? No, we don't know all the laws of physics. Probably any set of physical laws that you could invent, you will find a process in the human mind which does not exactly follow it. That sounds very strange what I'm saying. So I think uh, I, I, I'm, I'm very much in, in favor of, of AI, but I'm more in favor of developing the human mind. And I'm not sure AI is helping very much, but as a tool, it's a very good thing. When I said analog computers, I think the future, we're getting to the end of the Moore's law probable, that is the increase in the density of transistors on a chip. So I think the future will be analog computers. What does analog computer mean? It means a physical process you control sufficiently, which operates in an analogous way to the physical process that you're trying to calculate. So quantum computer is that kind of thing. Although the quantum computers today are modeled on digital logic, but there are plenty of physical processes which we could use to make computers. But this is the future. Almost nobody is working in this direction. In quantum com uh, computers, yes, but analog computers, otherwise, almost no one. There's a lot of money in 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 in, in the digital uh, area. <laughs> Thank you very much.